Hey everybody, how's everyone doing today? Doing well? Yeah. Who's excited to learn about sacred mushrooms in Atlanta? Yeah. Yeah. Who here already knows about sacred mushrooms in Atlanta? No? Anyone? So, you know, one of the questions, so I just want to give a little bit of bra background here. I'm from Atlanta. I was born at Northside Hospital and I've been foraging for 12 years. And one of the impetuses for me to start my foraging journey was because I was looking for mushrooms that altered my consciousness to help me connect with the divine, and I couldn't find them. It turns out that sometimes people sell you the wrong thing, or they uh, just don't sell you anything at all and take your money, and that's what happened to me. Um, and I just decided that I really wanted to learn where these mushrooms grow and why they grow. Um, it took me 10 years to figure it out because I had no idea what I was doing. And over the course of my journey, I learned a lot about why sacred mushrooms grow and what is a sacred mushroom. And in addition to getting my degrees from University of Georgia in social work and public health, I've also gone on a spiritual journey you know, through foraging and through connecting with the plants and mushrooms. So hopefully after this talk, you'll have a deeper appreciation for the plants and mushrooms in Atlanta, how to connect with them safely, legally, spiritually, and to just have a deeper understanding of what you might be seeing in your backyard and not fully understanding its importance. So, as I said, I've been foraging in Atlanta and Athens, Georgia when I went to UGA, and I'm still learning something new every day. So I gave a foraging hike today in Decatur. We found a lot of mushrooms and plants, and still every hike there's something that I learn. There's something that one of you knows about maybe growing mushrooms, growing plants that I don't know. And it's really fun to have events like this uh, Atlanta Mushroom Festival where we can all come together and share our knowledge. So if there are people in this audience that are like really excited about plants and mushrooms and you have something that you know, I'd love to hear it because I might not know it and we can all just elevate our knowledge together. So this picture, does anyone recognize this mushroom here? It's a pop quiz. Uh, portobello. <laughs> oh, the, the portobello would get you going really crazy. So, yeah, it's an Amanita mushroom, and this is Amanita muscaria. And so this is actually one of the oldest mushrooms, if you look at the genetic history. It's been around for 20 million years, I believe. And whereas the psilocybin mushrooms have been around for 10 million years. So these actually predate psilocybe mushrooms. And... There's a lot of nuance to using Amanita mushrooms. I would say if you're interested in it, there's a Facebook group called Amanita Mushrooms and Allies. There's 30,000 people there that are just talking about how to use this mushroom and process it for maybe it's shamanic uses or maybe it's to go to sleep and have dreams. And it's, a, it's actually completely legal regardless of religious status to use this mushroom. So you may see Amanita muscaria gummi, gummies being sold, but this, this mushroom in particular, and there's another one that grows in Georgia called Amanita persicina, which is the peach colored. So it looks like that, but it's a little bit more peach, a little orangey yellow. Um, if you eat it raw, you will have a pretty strong experience of like nausea, kind of um, disassociative experiences. But if processed correctly, this is what Alice in Wonderland was basically written upon. One bite makes things bigger, another makes things smaller. And so uh, a friend who was an Amanita shaman gave me a few Amanitas at the Georgia Mushroom Festival. I did not eat them at the Atlanta Mushroom Festival, mind you. But at Georgia Mushroom Festival, we ate a few. And this is just kind of going into the experience that um, they say that this mushroom predates or created the Santa Claus experience. So when you take this mushroom, you feel like you're on a sleigh. Now most of us here in Georgia have no idea what that feels like. And to me, it felt like I was in a bathtub getting shaken back and forth, side to side. And it feels like you're going through this tunnel and you're like being pulled through the sleigh. It makes your cheeks flush red and it makes you sweat. So Santa often has these red cheeks and he's sweating. The um, shamans who would forage them would wear red with white tips at the end, just like Santa's outfit. And then they would enter through the top of the, um, the igloos, 
just like going through the chimney, and they'd string up those mushrooms around the fire to dehydrate them. And so this mushroom, when I, I ate the Georgia version, um, I, it also can give you thought loops. Has anyone had thought loops before? You know what thought loops are? So <laughs> when I ate these mushrooms, it, the thought loop was, I need to think this thought for the universe to start. I need to think this thought for the universe to start. Imagine thinking that a thousand times over and over again. That's what this mushroom did. And so we started the universe over, <laughs> and um, it was a very intense experience. Now, some people will boil it with lemon, take a little bit of a tincture, and they say it helps with their dreams. Um, it was scary. It was a difficult experience, and I was with somebody who knew the medicine, but there was a lot of different ways to process it. So anyways, I didn't plan to tell that story, but since I've got the photo up, um, Amanita muscaria or Amanita persicina, there's a, a bunch of different species of Amanita that contain the compounds muscimol, um, and they need to be processed correctly so you don't just pick it up and eat it off the ground. But we're going to go into what makes a mushroom or a plant sacred. So one of the ways that I kind of see like sacred and religion is kind of to have reverence for the world. And I think mushrooms and like, especially entheogens, which we'll talk about, um, they really bring you into the moment and encourage you to have gratitude for what, what you're taking into your body. And so we think of, you know, in, in my spirituality is that every plant and every mushroom is sacred. And at the same time, for the purposes of this talk, entheogens are plants and mushrooms that when you open your eyes, you see something a little different. Maybe that's God. Maybe that's the Buddha or the Tao. Um, if you're able to dialogue with the divine, as we call it. Some mushrooms and plants do that a little bit better than others. And each person's different. So these are mushrooms that are sacred to me, but we encourage everybody, if there's a plant or there's a mushroom that you're called to work with, that should be fine for your you know, spiritual belief. And we'll talk about the legalities and also why, for the purpose of this talk, I can't, I, I, we're choosing not to talk about like recreational use of mushrooms, but more so the religious aspects that we believe are protected by the Constitution and our First Amendment rights. So essentially, like I said, certain plants and mushrooms can help us feel directly connected with God. So psilocybin mushrooms, psilocybin-containing mushrooms, a lot of people mention either seeing God, Jesus, Mary, you know, some sort of divine figure or connection. Um, and also that these, these mushrooms play an important role of Atlanta mycology and ecology. So the fact that these mushrooms can be grown in a friend's you know, closet, but they're also actually growing in a lot of Atlanta parks right now. And there's a reason that they're growing, and it may be sad, but there's also ways to like help improve the situation. Um, and so it helps us kind of interact with the forest and understand. So with each mushroom, I'll tell you where it's growing, why it's growing, and the lessons that I think we can learn from this. So you might have heard the term, who's heard of psychedelics, psychedelic mushrooms? And who's heard of entheogens? So less, more psychedelics, the idea that mind manifesting, which actually the idea of a mind in general is a religious concept that can, comes from Christianity. So I already kind of see it as a religious thought, but the, the term that we often use is entheogen, and that means to feel God within you. And so when, when you take these mushrooms, some people have grouped them into more the religious experiences, and it doesn't, you don't have to have a religion to you know, take these mushrooms and have an experience, but essentially there's a lot of ways to conceptualize mu the mushroom experience and being in Georgia, being in a place that allows us to practice our religion, we think it's important to make that distinction so that we have the legal protection of our whole community. So if you don't make that distinction, if this is not religious for you, it's not legal in the state of Georgia to use these mushrooms. So. The a dictionary definition is a psychoactive hallucinogenic substance or preparation, such as psilocybin or ayahuasca, especially when derived from plants or fungi and used in religious, spiritual, or ritualistic contexts. So as a, we call ourselves a synagogue, it's not a church, but it's not a synagogue, it's a synagogue where we come together to help Gaia heal. Um, 
we do use mushrooms in a religious context that we believe is protected by the Constitution and that we need to connect with the divine. So the Georgia State Constitution says, we have freedom of conscience. Each person has the natural and inalienable right to worship God, each according to the dictates of that person's own conscience. And no human authority should in any case control or interfere with such right of conscience. Now, the, the right of freedom of religion should not be construed as to excuse acts of licentiousness or justify practices inconsistent with the peace and safety of the state. So what we do as an organization is we make sure that everybody who's participating is doing this for a religious purpose because that's the only thing that's protected by this constitution. But also that we're safe and we're making sure that people are not doing things that could harm their own well-being or the well-being of other people. So with driving, you know, being in public, um, there's a few ways that we make sure that everyone has a safe time with, you know, maybe this isn't the right time to take mushrooms given medications or given a certain time in your life. So really the goal is that people can connect with the divine however you need, but to make sure that this is a safe, protected practice. And so our story, wholeatl.org, we started this organization last year, my partner and I, and it's a 501c3 C3 organization based in Atlanta, Georgia. We meet in Midtown on Thursdays. And uh, if you want, you can uh, put your phone at that and that will take you to the, the website there. But essentially, in order to have this protection, in order to have sincerity, we have to practice what we preach and what we believe. So we bring people together and we connect with Taoism. And one of the things that I like about Taoism is the first sentence says, the Tao that can be told is not the eternal Tao. And that's in the Tao Te Ching, the book of the way and of virtue. So we, we also understand that each person here has a different ancestral lineage. You have religious teachings from your ancestors that I don't have, and we want people to be able to embrace their, their ancestral Tao, or the Tao of their ancestors. Hey, Jamil, what's up? Um, been a long time since high school. Um, and so, yeah, and, and engage Buddhism. If anyone knows Thich Nhat Hanh, Thich Nhat Hanh is an amazing, you know, Buddhist thought leader. Um, and Druidry as well. Some of these mushrooms grow in Druid Hills, kind of ironic. Also, they said Druid Hills is a place where Druids would like to live. There's a lot of oak trees. These mushrooms like oak trees as well. And... Um, we actually did a hike to the Druid Arch in Utah this week, last week. And Druidry basically, um, what I love about it is that it was a religion where there was only about 12 pages written about it. And then in the 1800s, people thought, you know, I, I, I'm not necessarily Anglican Christian. I'm not necessarily atheist. Where's the next option? Like, what can I do? And the Druids revived this religion, created a brand new religion that brought people outside, connected them with nature, with ritual, and with community. And um, we really like, enjoy their practices. And one of them, which is so important, is understanding the plants, understanding the mushrooms, understanding each one of their teachings. And then partnership cultures as well. So with religion, there's either the dominator culture religion or there is the partnership culture. There's either the chalice, who's partnership, or the blade, who's killing everybody. And we chose the partnership and the nonviolent approach. Um, so those are some of the, the foundations. And essentially, I was raised Jewish, and my ancestry is in the Middle East. And we don't have those plants and mushrooms that grow in the Middle East. We have a completely different set of beings that live here. And part of my hope is that we can connect with the trees and the plants and the mushrooms that live right here so we can all have, you know, a religious experience. Like in our culture, we like import in certain foods to, you know, to, to have ritual, whereas here there's so much that grows that we can appreciate. So we're encouraging people to come up with a spirituality that meets your needs and that protects you legally. So just an evolutionary tree of religion real quickly. About 100,000 years ago, animism, which is on one of our lists as well, animism basically, so who here has had an experience with psilocybin mushrooms before? Okay, cool. So when you see a tree breathing, right, you've seen this, you've seen auras around trees, it seems like the trees are alive. Well, animism is just basically that, that each, you see a tree, it's not the same exact spirit as that's coming from the rock, 
or coming from another plant or an animal, but you can see the essence and the spirit within something. And so that is a very common, in Europe, 40,000 years ago, animism. Bushmen, a thing that would be Africa, 40,000 years ago, animism. Iranian, pantheism, like animism in India, and the Aborigines. So animism, basically seeing that there's life in all beings, maybe different life, was something that all of our ancestors practiced. And it's part of our spiritual connection as well. So I think that the mushrooms specifically help remind us that the trees are alive, <laughs> they might be breathing, they may be talking to you, and that's, they might be walking, exactly. So <laughs> moving very slowly. So now this is a really cool link for anyone who was curious about which mushrooms, which entheogenic mushrooms grow in Georgia. It's amazing. This is how many different species are native. So if people are buying shrooms or psilocybe cubensis, does anyone know what uh, cubensis means? Means that the first time they found it, it was in Cuba. So cubensis were found in Cuba. They also grow, I mean, they grow on cow manure, right? People know about that. And they can grow in Georgia. Um, however, I don't think that they're native to here. Uh, the, I mean, the, they'll grow here as well, but... Anyways, some, sometimes with knowledge like Virginiana means they found it in the U.S. or in Virginia. And so it may still live here. Um, but so we're, uh, today I'm going to talk about three species of psilocybin-containing psilocybin mushrooms that you probably haven't heard of but that grow in your backyard. And if this, if this is not part of your religious experience, then this is purely educational, and please do not interact with the mushrooms. However, if it is your religious connection that you need to connect with God through the use of mushrooms, then use these intentionally and know how to do that safely, legally on your own property, and be protected. So, so we'll be talking about Gymnopilus luteofolius, which I was just at Music Midtown. I didn't go. I just like walked around because I live real close. And there was some popping up right in the park. And they probably made it on people's feet. And they're probably all throughout the park at this point. Um, Gymnopilus, another one. Subspectabilis, I've not found that one. Inosibi, this is... So, so one thing I'm going to you know, put forth here is that if you're foraging for these mushrooms, they are related to some that can be toxic, Okay. So there is a deadly mushroom that, or potentially deadly mushroom that looks similar and is in the same family. So that means that we wanna exercise extra caution with mushrooms that can be confused. So there's plants, if you know about parsley family, there's deadly poison hemlock. So if you're in the parsley family, you don't wanna just try it out. Same thing here, if you have a small little brown mushroom, it could be psychedelic, it could be deadly. There's ways to know, and that's what I'm gonna share, but it, use caution because they are connected with mushrooms that may be toxic in certain amounts. Um, so then this inosibi, when you look at it under a microscope, the spores look like stars, so that's kind of cool. Um, the panaeolius, these are called pans, pancyanescens, so these are often on dung as well. I, what I'm going to be sharing in this is only mushrooms that I've found, and I don't forage the pastures because I don't have a pasture to forage. If anyone does, you know, maybe I'll check it out. But um, these are often found on cow dung. And um, two other paneolius, which may or may not contain psilocybin. Um, this one's interesting, paneoliopsis, which I believe I found. It didn't turn blue, and the, the guy who created this whole list didn't think that that was the ID, but we still, we, we kind of disagree on that one. Um, Pluteus americanus. So does anyone know about the deer mushroom? Has anyone happened upon a deer mushroom? It's very common. Um, pretty decayed wood. You'll see this like pinkish, brownish mushroom growing out of decayed wood. It's extremely common in the fall and winter. There's one in Florida, at least I know, and, and in Georgia that turns blue and is slightly psychoactive. I know of a friend who's actually foraged these before. I don't know about his experience with them, but it's very rare to find it. Um, Psilocybe carulensis, so, uh, formerly known as P. wileyi. So this one is one that I'll be talking about today that grows also in this area. Um, and then carulipes is not one that I'm as familiar with. It's, I believe, connected with carulescence. 
Cubensis, those are your typical, if anyone's heard of penis envy apes, you know, golden teacher. Those are all just one species. And there's over 100, maybe 150 plus species that contain psilocybin. So we're really, it's kind of like this idea that kale, kohlrabi, like broccoli, they're all the same, brassica, olerica. We're, you know, penis envy, the golden teachers, they're all just psilocybin cubensis. Not a not good or a bad thing, but that's just one species and there's so many more to know about. Um, psilocybin ovoidiosystidiata, it's got a lot of syllables. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that one too because that is one of the most common ones that I find and uh, those are the ones that I have the most experience with. And then psilocybin tampanensis, this one is the truffle. And it's the truffle that they sell in the Netherlands. Comes from Tampa. Sometimes they called it Psilocybe Atlantis, like Atlanta. But there has been one reported in Atlanta, and it's very hard to identify, but there's a truffle under the ground, and the mushroom comes up out of people's grass. So I often don't forage in grass. And the reason I told you all that I started looking for these mushrooms and never found them was because I was going into a forest. And these mushrooms do not tend to grow in forests. They tend to grow in, in areas that have been kind of cut down in some way. So uh, a, a forager named Sam Thayer, he says there's not look-alikes, there's look-similars. So if we're really intentional and we're really looking, it's not that the deadly one is just going to kill you out of nowhere. <laughs> there's things to look for. Um, it, it looks similar. So this is Gallerina marginata. It could look like Psilocybe gymnopolis and flamulina. And 10 mushrooms can kill a child, give or take. Um, and so I put this because the family Hymenogastri Hymenogastraceae, that's the same one as the psilocybe mushrooms. It's the same one as the gymnopolis. So they're in this family. And I'm just going to teach you kind of how to identify these mushrooms. So this is what's called a ring. You all see that ring there? There's a ring often, but not always. And we'll, we have more pictures. Right here, you can see the spores are this rusty brown, this like black right here. And you can also see that it's growing on really decayed wood. Like the wood is very decayed. This would be in the winter. There's no leaves on the trees. And they're not often growing in clusters. But I'll show you, this one is growing in clusters. So again, we have this ring here. Um, there's really nothing on the top. There's no patches. And it looks like it could be a little bit wet. So it contains the same deadly amatoxins found in the death cap, so not ideal to ingest. Um, could be an $800,000 experience, say that. Um, ingestion in toxic amounts causes severe liver damage with vomiting, diarrhea, hypothermia, and death, potentially. And there's been about 10 poisonings attributed to the species. So that's kind of interesting because this mushroom is really widespread, and so there is the thought that it's not necessarily like highly responsible for killing people because you'd have to eat a decent amount. But in general, I've got some photos, but this is another property that you'll find on um, this Hymenogastraceae, this, this family, is that they start wet and they start a darker color and then they turn light as they dry out. So that also happens on the psilocybin mushrooms. Um, but, but so anyways, this Gallerina marginata is widespread in the Northern Hemisphere, including Europe, North America, and Asia, also found in Australia. It's often on conifer wood. Um, and yeah, so they have yellow to brown caps, and the gills give this brownish rusty spore print. Um, and we'll see the mushrooms that you know, have these psychedelic properties or entheogenic properties uh, look a little bit different. But one thing to notice is that there's no hairs on the top of this. We'll point out a mushroom that does have hairs. You can see the gills here too a little bit. We call that striate margins. Um, but in general, when you're talking with beginners and why it's a good idea to go with somebody who knows what they're doing and not just to go alone, is the little brown mushrooms, this can be one that you find that, you know, um, let's see, I've got a photo. Here's another photo. So I thought at one point, maybe I was five years into foraging, that this was an enoki mushroom. And I took some photos and put it on Georgia mushrooming, which I recommend you all follow. And they're, yeah, and they're like, so is Josh kidding? Like, what is he talking about? And a friend's like, no, he's not one to kid. And yeah, I was away from my computer. I didn't eat the mushrooms, but 
Oh, I, I just posted a picture of some deadly mushrooms. Now, the amount I posted wasn't enough to kill me. Luckily, I didn't eat it at all. Um, but that's where friends and like a community is really helpful before putting anything into your mouth, getting three people to like say this is what it is. But ideally, being able to read, you know, that it's mostly on a kind of for the, the fruit bodies are yellow to brown, like going through every line and understanding the words. If you're going to eat a mushroom or a plant alone, you need to know every word of the description, basically. Or to have a friend eat it first and then, you know, <laughs> hand it to you after a day. Yeah. If your friend's going to hand it to you, like ask them how many times they've eaten it, you know. Maybe they'll eat it first and you'll be like, I'll catch you tomorrow or the next day because it could take a few days. Um, but again, so these have these, these brownish kind of spores. Um, it's on super decayed wood, so it can grow on wood chips. I don't often see them on wood chips, but the thing that gets complicated is that in Atlanta, I only see these growing in January, like in the cold, whereas in the Pacific Northwest, they'll grow at the same time, or they'll, they'll grow in the winter as well, but Gymnopolis, which I'm gonna talk to you about today, grows in the winter in the Pacific Northwest. So. It's more of a problem if you're in the Pacific Northwest. This is more likely to be right next to um, certain psilocybe mushrooms. But again, this one right here is another gallerina. So that's just to say, before you start looking for these mushrooms, just know there are some mushrooms that will be very toxic and a, a problem. So this is Gymnopilus. And it's in the same family, but a different genus. And these you'll find probably all around Atlanta in wood chips. Like, has anybody ever seen anything like that before? So generally, so one thing to look for is that these, these hairs right here, this is kind of ironic name because gymnopilus means bald-headed, but this one actually have, has hairs on it. Many of the gyms don't have hairs, but yeah, so, and this, the purple uh, features is extremely unique, and uh, this one was growing in Buckhead, but so, just kind of, um, who's, who's heard of reishi mushrooms? You've heard of reishi? You've heard they've been used medicinally in China for like 2,000 years. Well, it turns out that this was the mushroom that was in the picture, Ling Zhi, Ling Zhi. And um, this mushroom could look like a reishi, but then they said that the reishi mushroom, they were drinking it and they were seeing God. And I don't know if anyone's drinking reishi tea before, but like a lot of it. Has anyone like seen God on reishi tea? It's possible, but I don't think, and, and so basically they thought more likely it was actually gymnopilus that people in China were using. And in the book of Herbs of Immortality from Taoist masters was this mushroom. Uh, and look at their mushroom drawings. These are amazing. So these are the drawings of mushrooms in the Herbs of Immortality. And I love how it's not just the mushroom, like uh, it's crazy, but it's also the backgrounds, whether there's mountains and trees. And so part of, you know, part of the reason that the spiritual aspect, we need something that works for the United States, for North America, and something that incorporates our own heritage is that the closest thing we have to the Southeast US is Southeast Asia. So they have a ton of mushrooms in Southeast Asia. They have Gymnopolis and Georgia is the same climate. So a lot of the mushrooms and plants that are in these books have relatives that grow here. Um, and they think that it was likely gymnopilus that they were talking about instead of the reishi mushroom for quite a little while. So here's another one. This one literally looks like a rainbow, right? Um, also growing out of wood chips. So one thing I wanna share about how these, anyone heard like of psychedelic mushrooms helping with depression? So one thing got me really sad. I like foraging mushrooms. Who here's heard of chicken of the woods? Okay. So there was this big chicken of the woods tree that fell down and I'd been picking it for like three years and gotten 50 pounds of mushrooms off this tree. And I've been advocating for them to like leave the tree in the park, like just leave the whole thing. Then we'll have mushrooms for decades. And they cut it up, chip it up, move it somewhere else, right? Has anyone seen that happen to their favorite trees? They like fall over and then they, they like ship it out of the park the next day. So that was really sad because we're losing a lot of nutrients and we're losing a lot of like, you know, a lion's mane. That could be like 30 years of food on one tree. 
And I'm biking one day and I bike around and I see this glowing mass of orange mushrooms. <laughs> and they're literally growing right on that mulch pile that had been chopped down. Another one was uh, a chopped down mulberry tree at Piedmont Park. I think they like didn't want the fruit getting on the tennis court. I mean, what a problem to have. And so they just chopped the whole tree down, very sad. And in those mulch piles, Gymnopolis popped out and they've been one of the most like potent mushrooms, the more potent Gymnopolis mushrooms. So I wanted to talk a little bit about Gymnopilus experience for those that are like interested in using these mushrooms to connect with God. This is another picture of mushrooms near Piedmont Park, um, in Piedmont Park, growing off of a stump. And you can see again how it's uh, purple with the hairs on top, then turns orange. Um, so this is complicated. If you look up mushrooms and you look up dosaging, right? Like you're like, okay, maybe I'll feel something at like 0 0.3, 0 0.4 grams of cubensis, right? Maybe a gram is a, they, they have words for these like a, a museum dose or maybe that means you could go into a museum and not completely like lose control. Um, and so the different levels go from seeing brighter colors to a direct connection with God that you're not leaving that chair for the next two to three hours, right? And these mushrooms are extremely variable. So that is one thing to know about Gymnopolis is that they're plentiful. You can find pounds of them. However, this says that, I mean, this says that 7.2 grams is a level four experience, but some people have taken 15 grams dried and barely felt anything. And I've had somebody tell me they've taken 20 to 30 grams dried and barely felt anything. And so I had found some of these mushrooms and tried them. I took, it was about 150 grams wet, which is 15 grams dried. And I think the colors were brighter. I connected more with community, but I didn't have much of a deep experience. Then another pile of mushrooms pops up and I hear from a friend that they took eight and a half grams dried and they had this extremely strong experience and had no idea that that was going to happen. I like helped, was on the phone with them like, and they ended up having one of the best experiences and feeling like a better wife and a better mother. Um, and so I'm like, I need to try eight and a half grams of these mushrooms. And uh, we were outside and it was about to rain, like that Atlanta rain that's just, you gotta get somewhere else. And I couldn't open my eyes, it was so intense and I had, like some people describe on ayahuasca, just seeing a lot of um, patterns, geometry, and being pulled into the field of different people I was working with. Um, and all I could do <coughs> at about two hour mark, I hadn't talked for the whole two hours. And when I was first going to try to speak, I, all I could do was laugh. And <laughs> just like how my words would not be able to put in, like I would not be able to put into words what just happened. That was what that like laugh came from. And they call them laughing gyms. So I thought it was extremely hilarious as I'm like cracking up. And I will say that these mushrooms have other compounds that the psilocybe mushrooms do not have. So they have gymnopolin in. And if you'd like think about cannabis, right? You've heard of THC, but then you've heard there's 360 different compounds in cannabis. So you just imagine in Gymnopilus, there's 10, 15, 20 different chemicals that you would not find in the psilocybe mushrooms. And so for me, it's been a, I encourage people to start low because you don't know. If you find a pile of two pounds of these mushrooms, it could be that you need a lot of them to feel something, or it could be that you need very little. And, um, and it's difficult for, for people if you have a date planned up and you're really excited and you know you want to really connect with the divine and have a spiritual experience. Um, but I really recommend going slowly and each, each pile seems to be a different potency. So that was an amazing experience for me and they definitely helped me connect with the energies of the trees. So I connected with a persimmon tree. Um, if anyone knows about the persimmons, they're falling right now, but they also like very slow growing. So like these like hundred year old slow growing trees are always very three dimensional when you look at them. So anyways, uh, I have no idea if any of that's accurate at all. Like that's the problem with, uh, and I don't want this to, to be construed as like, we need to make a pill and then everyone needs to take the pill because we'll never know. But that like you as the, you know, as the shaman of your own life or you, as your own guru, you need to find out what works for your body. 
And so I will say that um, people who have like taken you know, SSRIs for 10, 20 years, you might need to take more than the uh, typical people in order to feel something. So it is to say that, and this is happening with all kinds of mushrooms, it happened with cannabis. People breed them to be more potent and more potent, and so just giving somebody one gram of something doesn't mean you're gonna have the same experience over and over again. So it's important to know that. And I should say, this is the same thing as peaches. There's a study where they analyzed the vitamin C content of peaches, and one peach had 65 times more vitamin C than the other. So just giving you a peach and saying it's 200 milligrams vitamin C doesn't mean much at all, and it depends on when it's harvested. So I would say harvesting these before they drop the spores, they would be more potent. Harvesting them when they're more at their purple phase as opposed to being more at the uh, orange phase right there um, would be more potent as well. But still something that I'm exploring, but if you were to look up a map of where these are, they're all over Atlanta, and, and there are maps online too. So. So this is a study as we get into psilocybin mushrooms where they actually tried to quantify how much psilocybin is in the mushroom per gram. And they found that the ovoids here, which one of them I'll talk about, has five to 10 milligrams per gram, whereas cubensis has one to five milligrams per gram. So the ovoids can be twice as potent as the cubensis mushrooms, or they could be just as potent as them. They're both one to five or five to 10. So um, even when I work with somebody who has experiences with other mushrooms, it's still hard to know exactly what your experience will be until you connect with that mushroom and work intentionally with it to make sure that you know what you're going to experience. Um, and then there's the carulescens here, which is at less than one milligram per gram. So those ones are not very potent. Just depends though, sometimes they are. <laughs> and so really uh, what I want, you know, is that this is gonna be a discussion as to why they want everyone to take a pill of psilocybin so everyone knows they're getting 10 milligrams of this and that. But really in the end of the day is each mushroom probably has 300 plus compounds that we can track and measure. And you're not gonna be able to replicate what a mushroom can give you by just extracting one active component and giving everyone the same experience. But that is to say to, you know, have somebody with you, make sure the set and setting is correct, and just understand that the, the potencies vary widely with um, ovoids. We call them ovoids because that's too many syllables. Um, these are probably the most potent. So this picture was taken right near Ponce de Leon Avenue. So they grow all over the place. Um, if you see me by the road, <laughs> you know, wave, I guess. Um, but again, same family as the deadly mushrooms and sometimes can look similar. Though, one thing I notice about these is they have these like waves here. That's very unique. Um, they, sometimes they call them the wavy caps. But, uh, and here you can see they're, they're very blue. But this picture here looks very similar to the Gallerina marginata, doesn't it? I mean, one thing is that Eventually, they turn blue, so the deadly Gallerina mushrooms are not going to turn blue. Or, or, so you can see this is when they're bruised. Theoretically, they're releasing psilocybin to uh, prevent the insects from eating them. And so for ovoids, they call them ovoids because their sp spores or cystidia look like eggs. And so some mushrooms, they call them deer mushrooms because their cystidia look like antlers. So it's just scientists trying to have a good time. They're looking under microscopes, trying to find sig like symbols and names, and sometimes the names are just that simple. But so ovoids, they're native to Eastern US. They range from Kentucky to Rhode Island and Mississippi to Georgia. And they're particularly common in the Ohio River Valley. Um, and the person who studies this also said they're very similarly related to ones in Thailand that may actually be the same exact mushroom. So they could also be living in Thailand. Um, <clears throat> but they'll often grow in woody debris of overflow areas in man-made mulch and wood chips, sometimes found alongside of Japanese knotweed. So this would be along the creeks. And when there's mulch, the number one reason there's mulch is because usually um, they're cutting trees. And when would you cut trees? Well, to get to your water pipes, 
to get to like any pipe, basically, they're constantly cutting and mulching. So water pipes near the river where there's mulch and there's a certain tree, which is the box elder, they grow a lot and they're often saying like, hey, you don't really need to keep cutting it down in this way, but in order to have these pipes, in order to have sewers and in order to have water, we constantly cut and mulch trees. So these mushrooms are prolific because we do that. Um, and so it's currently recently identified species and every time they look, at one point they said Atlanta was as far south as they go, but then they found them in Tampa. So they, they seem to go pretty far south. But the interesting thing, the seasonality varies greatly. Um, and so in the northeast, they're most common in the spring from mid-April to late June, peaking in late May. And, but in Georgia, this year I found them on February 17th. And, and we found them until June. And then once it, now it's like, you know, getting into September, they'll probably start again soon. And the reason is they don't really grow when it's above 85 degrees. So, and they don't grow when it's below freezing. And so Georgia, if you look at what's going on, like this is kind of our second spring. Now we're getting ready for long sleeves, getting ready for the same clothes. And the plants are like, all right, the leaves are gone. It's the same temperature. So we have a really unique climate here in Atlanta where we kind of get two spring-like experiences. One friend told me there's spring morel or uh, fall morels, which I've still never seen. But, um, but Georgia, because of our long growing season, is extremely unique. Um, and you can find these almost all year round, except for when it's over 85 degrees. So that's really interesting. But the main thing and what I like, just like I said, learning these, these terms. So the gills, these are what's underneath um, on the hymenium, so it's kind of connected here. The cap is conve convex or umbinate, so an umbo is kind of like a nipple. Those are very common to have like, here's the umbo right there. So it's like somewhat unique for these. It often has a ring, though it doesn't always. And the, the spore print would be purple. So the gymnop or sorry, the gallerina, the deadly mushrooms, would be a brownish, rusty brown, whereas these would be a purple. And it's psychoactive. So let's see what else we got. So here's some photos from the wild. This is my favorite photo ever. What the? Yeah. So I, I like how there's like a, a little uh, wolf spider hanging out. Um, and so one thing is like with identifying mushrooms, it's if you were to just look for these mushrooms and walk out in the middle of the summer, you wouldn't find them because they're not here. So if you're looking for a specific mushroom, you want to know when is it growing and what does it grow with? And so these are creeping Charlie, which funny enough, like today I was walking around and saw a bunch of green creeping Charlie again, or ground ivy they call it. And so that also tends to die in the summer and it's more of a winter kind of experience. So when the, the, the creeping Charlie is all over the place, and you can see the, the discoloring and the bluing here. So again, we have the very wavy gills in the center and it discolors and turns blue. So that's extremely unique. This whole stalk as well turns blue. So <clears throat> that's one of the main characteristics between the deadly gallerina, which can turn a little bit blackish, but it's not going to be like the, the stems are completely blue. Another thing is that um, <clears throat> the, the stems there's some mushrooms that look similar that are not deadly, but they have very brittle stems. They call them brittle stems. It's pretty creative. These do not have brittle stems. So the psilocybe mushrooms that people know and that they eat, those stems, when you feel them, they're pretty tough, right? Like, they're not going to just break in your hand. There's some mushrooms that look similar that are very brittle. And they're not edible or, you know, not going to be toxic, but they're not the psychedelic ones. So again, I put in this picture, again, the wavy gills. And this umbo here, this kind of nipply like experience. But it's still, it has these, you can see the gills underneath. They call it serrated margins. Um, but the main thing is it's turning blue. And this whole thing would turn blue if you bruised it. And yeah, I reflected that. But the experience is here. Um, the most I've ever taken is 2.8 grams dried. And uh, that one was extremely intense. I could not open my eyes for... I was deeply breathing, seeing a lot of fractals, and then I sat on our balcony, and the blue woman from the Avatar was there in the trees, like, staring at me. 
like, you're going to advocate for the trees and, the, you know, share the story of the mushrooms, right? And I was like, hell yeah, I am, you know? Grow my hair long, connect with the trees, like, you know, same thing. And so, yeah, sold my car, changed my life. Uh, <laughs> I was going to sell my car anyways because I, I didn't really need it. And, um, but, but just to say that these mushrooms, uh, for me, I can take... So recently we took about a gram of these in, on a mountain in Utah and just had a really amazing experience connecting with the, the mountains and the local plants there. Um, oftentimes I'll, I prefer to have lower doses because I've already had these like deep life-changing experiences and personally, if I take more than two grams, I can get a headache for a day or two. That is something that happens. From my experience working with people, it's actually not super common. But for people that are highly sensitive to mushrooms, you really don't need a lot. And for some people, like even 0.3 or 0.4 grams is still a beautiful experience in your body, whereas other people need two grams to feel anything. So this is where even if you're going to like sign up for a ceremony to be in a group mushroom ceremony, you want to work with the person beforehand to know what your experience is or have the lowest amount possible, in my, in my opinion. Some people will start with very high doses, and um, I think it's important to know your body, to know yourself first before going deeper. And um, yeah, that would be the most, so, so an example we had, um, as part of our synagogue, we had a group ceremony where a few people took just one gram of mushroom. For two people, they were really feeling the effects, seeing fractals and connecting with the divine like immediately in front of them. And uh, two, I'd say about two people didn't feel anything and needed more. And a few other people, the addition of cannabis was helpful for them to like deepen their experience and really feel connected. But that's just to really impress upon you all that it's important to know your body. Um, if you were to eat food before taking these, it would be less intense, just like Advil. You know, it slows down the absorption so um, trying to keep the factors similar, if you normally, uh, we wouldn't recommend eating before taking these mushrooms, but, um, but yeah, so let's see. So we're going to go to carry lessons. So these are the wily eyes. Or, uh, this is extremely interesting. They call them the landslide mushrooms in Spanish, the rumbes, and they grow on clay, right? And this is also in, uh, in Decatur. So they grow in clay. And uh, they contain psilocybin. And so along with psilocybe mexicana and psilocybe acidecorum, it's one of the mushrooms likely to have been used by the Aztecs and is currently used by Mazatec shamans for entheogenic experiences. And so at, at first they thought that this mushroom only existed in Georgia. And then they found that it's the same mushroom that exists in Mexico in landslides, about 3,000 feet in elevation. And a friend has a theory that um, a lot of this is common in Marietta and like northwest of Atlanta and there's a lot of evidence of trade in the Indian Etowah Mounds from Central America and it is possible that the spores made it from Central America here. It's hard to really know whether it's native but it doesn't seem to grow in Florida, Alabama, uh, Tennessee, North Carolina. It seems to be almost only in Georgia and Mexico. And these ones from my experience have it all depends. So if, if you do use cannabis, it, it amplifies the experience to the point where I took just 0.6 grams of these mushrooms with the cannabis edible, and it was an amazing experience in the woods, very connective. Um, I had to give gratitude before walking past many of the trees, um, especially you know to honor the animals that were in the area and to ask permission. Um, it was super connective, but then I've also seen that it's not as strong of an experience if, if cannabis is not involved as the ovoids or maybe even as psilocybe cubensis. So these ones pop up in the summer. They're probably popping up right now. And I have some friends that go and collect these and really love to, to see where they pop up. But these often grow in sweet gum and pine forests where land has been cleared to make developments. So if you have a new neighborhood, pretty sad, looks pretty sad when you see it first happen. And then two to five years later, these mushrooms start popping up in your Bermuda grass in the front yard. And so they are in people's front yards in most of the suburbs. And they're, they're very common. They'll, this is just a small one, but there will be lots and lots of these mushrooms. Um, it's not one that I have a lot of experience with because 
they tend to be in bare land habitats and I tend to hang out in the forest. But, um, but yeah, they can be found and they are around the area. So here's another beautiful photo of them. So they can look like almost completely blue um, or they could also have this color. They smell a little bit like cucumber. But so now I wanted to leave time for a Q&A and if, anyone wants to, if anyone's had any experiences with any of the mushrooms described or if anyone has questions um, about, about these experiences. So the question was, if the mushroom is blue or purple, is it pretty much safe? So the answer is um, no, probably. Um, so we'll try to stay like away from general um, heuristics, we call them. They're, like, they're normally right, and then sometimes they're not. So the mushrooms that are, um, let's see, the mushrooms that turn blue here and have gills, the actual gills, those tend to be the psilocybin mushrooms. But if there's pores or little circles on the bottom, those are boletes, and they're very common, and you can cut one in half and it'll turn completely blue, and that's a completely different compound, some of which um, can cause gastric and intestinal problems. But the main thing that you're looking for is that there's gills, which kind of overall, some, a lot of the deadly ones have gills. So the destroying angel has gills. The, the gallerina has gills. So some people will say, just avoid gills and you'll be good, right? Like, there's also some that don't have gills that you don't want to eat. But, um, but generally, it's that the stem that's pure white, that's tough, turns blue, and it has gills on it. And the top, the top has this umbo like a nipple looking thing. So if it was just flat, it wouldn't be like that. Um, and then that there is these wavy, wavy gills here is very unique for ovoids. So the main thing they'll say is like never identify something just based on one factor. Like, oh, it's blue. Or, oh, there's an umbo. Or you, you, want all, you want to check the boxes on every little thing. And even though each picture will look different, you know, each picture kind of looks different. You're, you're starting to see okay, the edges are turning blue, the stalk's turning blue, there's waves, there's a little umbo there. You know, it's growing in the right, the right place. So that's a good question. And uh, I will say before eating anything, um, it's important to, you know, we could talk about, see, yeah, we could talk about um, if you want to identify something in the woods and you want to eat it, the first thing, if you think like, okay, I found one of these mushrooms, that's a tentative ID. Then you can go online or you could send a message to me or you could Atlanta mushrooming and you could say, hey, like, this is what I think it is. Or if it's one of these, you could just say, I don't know what this is. What is it? And um, you could have a few people like confirm that, you know, what you think you have is what you have or people will ask questions. And then once you have that ID, if you were to look up these ovoids, you'd kind of go to something like this and it gets crazy towards the bottom where they have all these microscopic features, but you'd want to mark off all the points and say like, yes, it is turning this color. You know, it, the, it does have gills. It is umbo or convex. This, the gills are adenate, which means they connect to the mushroom in that way. There is the spore print. So you want to try to check off all these boxes before just, just putting a mushroom in your mouth, yeah. What other questions do y'all have? So these like to grow on box elder. So box elder is, it looks like poison ivy, but it's a tree. And uh, it's, it's a maple tree. But the leaves, like, if you don't know what they are, I've been scared the first time I saw it because I was, like, walking by box elder trees, like, trying not to touch the leaves. And um, I, I don't know if I could pull up a photo. But, but, yeah, basically box elder are pioneer species. So after land is cut down, there'll be some of the first trees that come up and they come up right by creeks. And so a friend found them because he was looking for morels. So if you're looking for morels, you might find these. And if you're looking for these, you might find morels. So, and it's around the same time of year as well. So a little happy little surprise. And uh, I lead a lot of foraging hikes and sometimes people ask me how my morel foraging was. And I just, I don't know what to say because I'm not really looking for morels at that time of year. But, um, but you might find them because they're in the same kind of habitat. What other question? 
or experiences. Does anyone have any experiences uh, with any of these mushrooms before? Probably not, right? Yeah, so the certain time of years, so that's important. So like it says, and this is the interesting thing, if you're Atlanta, Sacred Mushrooms of Atlanta, is that each state and each you know, bioregion is different depending on when there's moisture, when it's the right temperature. So this one says, if you're in the Northeast, common in the spring from April to late June, peaking in May. And then they can fruit as late as November. Whereas in Georgia, I found them from like February, mid-February, all the way into June. And then they'd start again in November and go all the way through the first freeze, basically. So they're basically out as long as it's not freezing and as long as it's still raining. And we do get a lot of rain in the winter. So, but in the Pacific Northwest, um, yeah, uh, it has turned up in the Pacific Northwest. So people have taken these in mulch. All they've done is basically take the wood that it's growing on and moved it out west. And it's growing in Washington and Portland. And I don't necessarily recommend like taking species to other states but it is one that has, that people will find in mulch beds in like Oregon now, even though it's not necessarily its native range. Whereas the Gymnopolis, these are the summer mushrooms. So right when the ovoids stop producing, the Gymnopolis come up in May, um, sometimes is like late March, all the way until like now is kind of the end of their season. I saw some yesterday, so these pop up all throughout the summer. So there's literally something growing as long as it's not freezing in Georgia all year round. So that's kind of interesting. And the, the carry lessons, they're also, uh, these ones are also summer, so they're probably growing right now, especially after this rain. Um, I have noticed that these and the Gymnopolis can take 10 days after rain. So it'll rain, the mulch pile just sit there, 10 days later, you see in the driest of days, 90 degree heat, this huge mass of mushrooms. And often the ants, I think the ants actually eat them. Um, there's literally ants on them like eating Gymnopolis mushrooms, specifically Gymnopolis. And are they connecting with God? I mean, it literally looks like, and I, I, a friend like sent me a photo. I'm like, oh, those are Gymnopolis. And he called me, he's like, dude, you didn't tell me about these ants, man, it's crazy. And like, like literally pulled the whole cluster out full of ants. Um, and that's not the case with all those mushrooms, but in Central America, the leaf cutter ants actually harvest leaves to grow mushrooms. So it's not super crazy that these ants are actually gardening this mushroom. So that's exciting. I choose to believe that. I've got some videos of them eating the mushrooms. So if anyone doesn't believe me, there's, there's proof. Yeah. What other questions y'all have? Hotspot, yeah, where should you put on your GPS location? Um, <clears throat> Hotspots. Well, does anyone, does everyone have iNaturalist? You all seen that? So on iNaturalist, and I don't get paid for this, it's free app, um, you can just put in the species and see what people post. And if you find it, you can post some. But truly, um, I've, for people who are spiritual and connected, um, I've really, wanted to share these gymnopolis mushrooms and whenever i go to somebody's place to like gift it to them it's already growing in their mulch anyways like so almost any mulch pile i've seen has gymnopolis in it like it doesn't have to but sometimes like more than 50 percent of the mulch piles i see will have it eventually um so basically the creeks for the ovoids like if you're looking for the ovoids are places where the creek overflows so like, oh, this is a great park, except for in the spring when it's like just flooded. Well, that's a good spot to go. And then if they're chopping down, I haven't done this, but a friend um, just got a map of all the sewer lines and stuff, and they just like clear all of the sewer lines and leave all the mulch. And so they tend to be like on sewer lines. And sadly, they just destroyed the whole Beltline Trail, or I mean, sorry, they're building a Beltline. Have you all seen that? Like go to the back of Piedmont Park and they just chopped everything. I don't know where all the mulch went from that, but it was a lot of box elder trees. Um, but just the mushrooms, and what's so important about these is they grow on disturbed land. 
So they're literally trying to help heal the land that's been destroyed. It's amazing, yeah. Yeah. So the question is if they follow the natural water trail. I think one of the thoughts was that the ovoids might have come from the Ohio River Valley and then followed that. So the spores definitely like, especially when the, the stream banks flood. So it's a combination of um, if like a box elder tree falls and it just drops a little bit at a time, there'll be some mulch. But if you like mulch it completely, so like a, a city park, I'd say, thanks to city parks, but they literally just dump buckets of mulch and so instead of just having one or two mushrooms, you have huge clusters of mushrooms because they have more surface area and more food to eat. So that's the thing is that these old trees are falling and they're getting put in mulchers every single day in Atlanta. And wherever that mulch ends up going, like highly likely that some sort of mushroom uh, will grow on it. And those, those are very common. So I'd say gymnopilus are like, like all of the parks, like almost every city park that puts mulch somewhere will eventually have one of these mushrooms in it. And Atlanta seems to be a hot spot. It's possible that, uh, I like how Paul Stamet says, the kids, there was a time where I was, I was foraging some of these mushrooms and like kids were just running all over. No one told them, no, no one stopped them. They asked their teacher, what's this? And she's like, don't put it in your mouth. But they're literally holding a, a psychedelic mushroom that no one planted, like they're just in the mulch. And so all of those spores got on those kids' shoes. And then they ran to playgrounds. And playgrounds are often full of mulch. So Paul Stamet says the kids are literally like spreading this shoe because they're the ones running around in mulch all the time. So I don't encourage like involving children in this, but like the reality is if you go outside and you walk on mulch, you've probably got spores on your shoes from these mushrooms. And um, they're just extremely common. So, so an interesting thing is that, um, does everyone know what a spore print is? It's when you take the cap of a mushroom and the spores come off. Gymnopolis mushrooms look like someone took that orange painter's tape and just sprayed it. Like they have such prolific spores that like almost every mulch pile in like Piedmont Park is when it rains, like the water will just go everywhere. And uh, it, the only way to stop it, now if the city of Atlanta is listening and you want to stop this, just leave the trees when they fall and we'll get the other mushrooms like the chicken of the woods, the hen of the woods, you know, we'll get, we'll get the, the edible mushrooms, but if you mulch it up, then it's going to create a lot of surface area. And so what's actually interesting is that the gymnopolis tend to grow on really fresh mulch, and then the ovoids tend to grow on really decayed mulch. So theoretically, if someone were to drop mulch in your front yard and you were a religious practitioner, having both of those would make sure that you got all of the mushrooms you needed for the rest of your life, and you could turn it into topsoil to grow plants and food and feed your family and community. So these could be really used to like rebuild soil, to help people heal, and then to plant food and actually like rehabilitate land. So our goal is to actually rehabilitate land that's been clear cut and help through micro remediation, create a food forest that we can all kind of be a part of. So what other questions do y'all have? Go over here. <laughs> Feeling good? Let's see what time we got. Uh, it's been about an hour. So I just want to really thank Paul over here for this Atlanta Mushroom Festival and for bringing in all of us wacky folks together and uh, it's really great to like have been this is probably the third or fourth one I've spoken at and to see people and friends and community members to meet new friends so definitely let's stay in touch I know that chances are you're all like interested in you know all kinds of amazing things and if we work together we can inoculate ATL we can make sure that our resources are being used so that these trees that have given so much can be honored and that we can make the most of what we have here. So we have a really unique space here in Atlanta, more mushrooms growing here than probably anywhere else. And uh, we've got the community to support this. And you know, if you wanna learn more about the legalities and how to make sure that this is, you're set up to be protected, come talk with us. That's been my focus after starting with marijuana activism, decriminalizing marijuana in Athens, and then moving into this space of understanding that we should be protected to connect with God and to do that through mushrooms and plants in Georgia. So 
Thanks so much, everybody, and stay connected. Yeah, if you want to join or follow the mailing list, or uh, if you want to get your mushrooms ID, there's a link to Atlanta Mushrooming there. Um, so there's all kinds of links on that that'll get you connected with us. And don't do this alone. You don't have to go in the woods and just eat something because I told you so. Like, send photos and get it checked off by one of us. So thanks, y'all.